Hey, sweet script developers, welcome back to our teardown of this map reduce. Uh, last time we finished looking at our get input data phase, and now we need to move on to our map phase. So, if we remember, we changed the way that our data was structured going from get input data into map. So, a lot of this is going to change, hopefully, get uh, a little simpler. Um, so our data formatting happens here in this CSV data to objects. And so what we decided to do was format each entry as an object with an ID property, a MAC address property, and an owner ID. So now we that's what will get sent. This format is what will get sent to map. So this is the format that map needs to understand now. So, um, and if you remember, so get input data will pass one element at a time back to map. And so we just need to parse the value so at this point, we should have one of, let's close this. We should have one of these objects. So it has an ID property, MAC address property, owner ID property. I'm gonna get rid of this because it no longer applies. We no longer need this result split. Uh, function and we want the key to be our MAC address and the value to be the internal ID. And I think those are pretty self-explanatory now. Comments seem unnecessary. Let's just make sure all of this is still. Applicable, there we go. And that is all we should need to do. Now, so the whole purpose of the map phase is to simply take our data and group it. Uh, so we are grouping. Uh, the key becomes the group. So we're grouping on Mac address. And once we get to reduce, we will have each key uh, each MAC address will have an array, potentially, of uh, internal IDs, custom record internal IDs associated with it, and those will all represent the potential duplicates. But that's it. That is all our map phase needs to do. We just need to turn the data from a string back into an object with json.parse, and then use the appropriate properties of that object uh, write them back to the context. Uh, and that's usually the case with map. Map's job, map's intention, is to group data. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, so generally, that doesn't take a lot of work. Uh, so map is, when, when you use it, you don't even always need it. It is optional. Uh, when you use it, it is often very short and simple like this because you're typically just kind of regrouping or reorganizing the data along a slightly different dimension. And that's it. That is all we need to do for our map. We are done with get input data. We are done with map. Let's move into reduce. So this is where the real work happens as usual. Reduce is typically the, the heavy lifter of your map reduce scripts. And so this is where the actual deduplication happens. Uh, now how, so the, the data format actually now is the same. So nothing changes with how reduce uh, reads the data. Uh, so this is the same. Uh, yeah, if it's less than two, so if there's no uh, duplicates, if there's only one internal ID, then there are no duplicates, so there's nothing to do. That's good, 
Good catch there. Looks like these are all the fields we're going to compare between the two records. You load the master. Now, there is a portion of the previous logic that we missed. Uh, we didn't really miss it, but uh, that we haven't reincorporated yet. Um, so if we recall the initial logic over here, uh, when the owner is 12, so when we have one very specific owner, then we put the record at the front. Uh, and so basically the the front, the first um, value in the array should always be the master record. Um, initially, the search results are sorted by uh, internal ID in an ascending order, which should put the uh, earliest created first. So basically the way that we select the master is that the first priority is uh, the ones that have this specific owner. And if there's not one of those, then the earliest created becomes the master record. And so what I want to do is make that selection process a lot clearer. Um, that is pretty hard to determine from this initial logic how we select the master. And so what I'm actually going to do is you probably guessed it, write a new function that uh, determines, it looks at all of the data in our uh, list of values and uh, picks the right one. But to do that, we actually need, we need to pass more data uh, from map into reduce because reduce needs to know the owner right now it only knows the mac address as the key and the internal id as the value and instead we're going to need to it's going to need to know and so what i'm going to do is actually just pass the entire uh, object from here and so our value or values rather in reduce become a list of keep losing track of my function a list of objects structured like this so a list of objects containing all this data the id the mac address and the owner id let's collapse some of these so i stop getting lost all right Let's do that first. So I'm passing the entire object as the value, so that will get stringified, and then we will need to parse that out. Um, and the way we can do that is that, so right now, context.values is a list, an array of strings, uh, strings that look like something like this where uh, but that's not what we want we want to we want them to be actual operable objects so we need to get the array and then map over it with json.parse so we are iterating through the array calling json.parse on each element that makes sure that each element becomes an object not a string Okay, when there's still, when there's less than two, we don't need to do anything. Uh, none of this changes. This is all some setup. Um, but here, what I want to do is basically write a function that looks at all of the values, all the data that we passed in, and returns the appropriate uh, master record ID. called these values group and then this 
will just become master record ID. Okay. So let's write the find master function. So this is the function that's responsible for looking at all of the data for a single, you know, it's looking at all of the records that share a MAC address. And it needs to look through, its first priority is to find the one with owner 12. So let's not hard code that. Um, this is another candidate for a script parameter. I may not do that at the moment. But okay, so anytime we have an owner of 12 somewhere in the uh, data list here, that one becomes our master automatically. So we're going to take the data and filter it. And we're going to filter it such that if anyone uh, has the master owner ID as its owner ID, that's the one we want. So Uh, now, filter always returns an array, no matter what. So we just need to be conscious of that. So let's see. So what we want to do is, and it, this could be, if, the, if there's no uh, records that match the master owner ID, then has owner will be an empty array. Uh, but it will be an array no matter what. So I want to check first that has owner is not empty. So if has owner dot length is non zero, then we want to return the internal ID of its first element. Otherwise, we simply return the internal ID of the first element in the original list. So this will break down if uh, multiple, well, I should say this will potentially break down if multiple records have this, have this exact owner. Um, then we're just choosing the first one. Um, I don't know, based on this logic, there's no selection criteria for what would happen uh, in that case. I suppose you could guess that since the search results are ordered in, are in ascending order, um, and we are shifting them onto the front if there are two or three or whatever if there are multiples of these the newest one will actually get 
uh, shift it will be at the front last. Um, but I'm not sure if that's intentional or not. My guess is that the intention is that there's only one of these. There's only one record that has this this owner. There's either one or none. Um, but by doing it this way, uh, by making this completely separate function for it, when we need to decide that, when we need to figure out, oh, well, what happens when there are multiples, uh, we can come right here into this function rather than trying to go here and modify this if else, then scrolling down and remembering that we have to also do it here uh, and then coming back again and changing up uh, this here, which one we select. Um, by doing it all and containing all of that logic, all of the master selection logic in one function here, uh, we have one spot to go to change this, one spot and one spot only. All we do is update this function and everything else uh, works exactly the same uh, because this is this, oops, collapse. This function is taking in all of our original data and spitting out the owner internal ID. Uh, and that logic is a black box to uh, everything out here. Everything, uh, the reduce function only cares that this value is correct. What's, what happens inside here is doesn't matter and is a black box. So um, when we do decide that our master selection needs to change, we want the newest record first instead of the oldest. Uh, we want to look for two other owners. Doesn't matter. Um, we just change this one function and everything else continues operating smoothly. Okay, so we load the master record, then we start loading all of the uh, subsequent duplicate records. So we are first looping through all the duplicate records. Um, the first one is our master. But actually, we don't know that anymore. Uh, we don't necessarily know that the first one is the master anymore. We only know that uh, this one is the master. It could have come, based on this function, it could have come from anywhere in the list, um, and that's okay. So we start that loop at the beginning, and basically if the values group of D, so the current, um, the current records ID is the same as the master record ID, then there's nothing to do. And we just move on to the next one. All right. Alternatively, we could filter out the master record from values group before we start iterating over it. That would also work. Um, this is sufficient for now. We've we've got some other code uh, before that kind of checks something and continues like this, so that's consistent. Right. So we then we start getting into we iterate over all of the fields, which I believe yes are here. We have this list of about uh, looks like twenty four, twenty five fields um, to compare. And we're going to iterate over each one, uh, read each value from it. Uh, so let's see. The temp field val is from the master, and the dupe temp val is from the dupe. 
Um, so if the master field is empty, then we set it to the dupe. Um, for Okay, so we have some date fields that need some special handling. Um, I'm going to skip the empty branch here, um, but in general, Empty branches that do nothing uh, don't need to be there. Uh, I suppose this is all right. Um, I would probably write this, basically this is saying if it's empty, uh, if it's empty, there's nothing to do. So instead of leaving it blank, let's see, yeah, instead of leaving it blank, we should uh, continue. Uh, and remember, there's a more robust way of checking for empty, more robust and also shorter. Okay. All right. There is a shorter way to check for a list of values like this. Um, and I might do... So I might do something like this. I'm gonna take each of the date fields, the date field IDs. And I'm gonna put them into an array. And we're not going to check any of this. Okay, so we've tracked which fields are our date fields. Uh, which so basically, which ones get this uh, this branch of special handling? And so now. All we need to check is, is this value, the one, the field that we're comparing right now, is it in this array? And to do that, we can use the arrays uh, index of method. In newer JavaScript, like ES6 and beyond, uh, there are even better ways to, to do this, but this is what we're stuck with in NetSuite and ES5.1. So, uh, basically, what is the index of this value in this array? Um, index of will return negative one if the value is not in the array. So as long as this value is greater than negative one, uh, we have found it. Well, so if the current field we're comparing is in the date fields array, then we give it to this uh, special handling. Now the nice thing about this is that when we, perhaps in the future, if we add new date fields uh, to this record and we want to compare them as well, we don't have to slide down there uh, into here and add another or statement and another condition. 
all we have to do is add the name of that field into this array and this uh, this will continue to work and we'll include that new field uh, let's see what, what do we do here if the dupe is no if the master is after the dupe or before it then we copy the memo hmm Okay, um, these are supposedly date fields. So I, I'm not sure that we want to compare this way. Uh, it's basically saying if they're not the same Right, as long as they're not exactly the same, uh, we copy the memo value. Um, but that's fine. I will leave it for now. Um, I like to do. Uh, I like to use uh, the moment library when I'm comparing dates, um, but I'm not going to uh, include that. I'm not going to add that to this script at the moment. Um, so other than that, this looks fine. Um, I would probably, I mean, we're really just checking that they're not the same. Uh, either the master is greater or it's less, uh, but not the same. So I would probably just do that as long as they're not equal. Uh, then we copy the memo. Okay. I'm not sure why we're copying the memo, uh, but again, that's uh, it's kind of up to the business logic behind this. I'm not sure how that memo field exactly is being used, uh, and that's okay. All right, so here again, we have a bunch of of empty branches, so I, I don't know why we're including them. Um, so I'm just going to cut them out. Well, I can't cut them out. Uh, I can't cut them out. Hmm. I'm starting to feel like there's a bug in this code, which is why I'm getting a little hesitant. I think this is supposed to happen later. Uh, no, maybe not, maybe not. This is just, if we get into here, if they're not the same, yeah, if they're not the same, we add the current date field to this string missing fields list. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a very confusing structure to follow uh, with all these ifs and else ifs. And uh, when I, whenever I see that, whenever I see deeply nested if elses or uh, uh, things like that, there's usually a better solution uh, but as I'm kind of looking at this for the first time I'm just kind of trying to wrap my head around it so when the values are the same we don't do anything if they if the duplicate values are empty we also don't do anything otherwise There, the two values differ. Hmm. I 
think I know why this was the way it was. Let's find out. Oops. Let's do a little test. So if we have two different dates, let's see. December 1st, 1900 and December 2nd, 1900 for now. What happens? A greater than B is false. That's true because December 1st is before December 2nd. B greater than A is true. Okay, good. Because December 2nd is after December 1st. Good. So the greater than operator is fine. I assume the less than operator is as well. Okay, so we can use those operators to compare dates just fine. Uh, what's happening under underneath is that uh, the date representation is being uh, translated into its, where is it? Uh, uh, why am I not seeing it? It's being uh, translated into its its number. Oh, right, because it's get time. Uh, it, get time is being called on it, uh, which turns it into a number, uh, and those numbers are what's being compared. Those numbers are milliseconds since the Unix epic, which I believe is January 1st, 1970. Uh, so that's a lot of milliseconds. So December 2nd, 1900 is a lot of milliseconds before 1970. Um, so if we change one of these now, if I do C, to also be December 1st, 1900, A is not greater than C, nor is it less than C, nor is it equal to C, because the equals operator for dates works differently um, it actually checks are these the same object are they the same uh, reference are they occupying the same memory space inside the computer uh, and they're not uh, a got stored in one spot and C got stored in a different spot so they are not the same reference that is why this date comparison is done this way uh, and Behavior like this is also why I try to uh, use libraries, third-party libraries like a moment to do date comparison for me uh, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel or remember that dates have really quirky behavior f like this. Uh, I can just let the third-party library maintainers remember that for me. Um, okay, so that should should stay as it was. And these, these empty branches are bugging me <laughs> a bit. Um, so basically when the values are the same, uh, we don't do anything. And if the dupes are empty, we don't do anything. Um, so what I'm actually going to say instead is that if they are not the same, I'm going to kind of flip the direction and combine these conditionals. Um, if they're not the same, um, so if we if we keep it as it, as it were, let's if we read through this, it's. This is the functionality we're trying to get to. So uh, we do this whenever um, nothing else before it has been true. So if these are the same, we skip over it. And if the, if the dupe values are empty, actually, if these are the same or these, the dupe values are empty, 
uh, the or part is important. So if these are not the same, so if there if there is a do dupe temp val, in other words, if this conditional is not true, if there is a dupe temp val, and the master and dupe do not match, then we do this. And we can get rid of all those empty branches. So if both of these are true, if if we get all the way down here, if we've checked everything else, uh, we've checked that the master field is, uh, we've checked that, at this point we've checked that, we've found that the master field is not empty. The We don't have a date field. Uh, so at that point, if there if there is a value in the dupe temp field and it doesn't match, the master, uh, then we need to add it to our list of, of string missing fields. I'm not quite sure what we do with this, this string missing fields yet, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, it looks like down here we have some special logic for the item core field for a specific item core. Uh, then we set inactive, we set the memo. So here's where our string missing fields comes in. So at the end of all of this, when we inactivate the duplicate, we set the memo uh, to contain all the fields that were changed. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so what I'm looking at is this logic uh, so the first thing I see is just uh, uh, let's just really quickly shorten some of this up a little bit so uh, we care about two important values here we care about the item core field and we care about the finished skew field I don't see any others uh, on the master record it looks like always and maybe on the dupe, yeah, the dupe as well. So let's just get all three of those and put them in variables. So the master core field. The dupe core field. And the master finished skew okay now this is checking if the master core has a value in it and we can do that just like that I'm sorry doesn't have a value so we do that like that uh, if it doesn't have a value then we are s copying the dupe value to it Okay, so dupe core. This was if the dupe value, so if the dupe core is null, the dupe core is empty, we do nothing. So for now, I will do that like this, but we have established how I feel about empty branches. So I'll come back and revisit that. Otherwise, if they're not the same, so if the master core is not the same as the dupe core, like so,
Then we check for, does the master finished skew have a value? Not have a value, rather, if master finished skew. If it doesn't have a value, we set it to the duplicate item core. Okay, dupe core. Uh, and if it does, if they don't match and there is no is a finished skew on the master, then we add this to the our missing fields note. Uh, so I'm going to take this once again. So this is basically we can combine these two conditions by saying if there is a value in dupe core and it differs from the master core, uh, and then we don't need those. So Boolean logic, being able to manipulate conditions like that, to combine them, to minify them, to optimize them, uh, to rearrange them, and still come out with the correct results is a very, very important skill, uh, but that does take a lot of practice. Okay. There are a lot of uh, rules and laws, like mathematical laws, that uh, let you do that and, and can really help simplify some of your logic sometimes and avoid these uh, large, deep, nested, else if branches. Because uh, those can get really hard to follow. They are exceptionally hard to test and verify uh, when you have a lot of them. Um, so any strategies you can start uh, learning and employing to minimize the, the number of branches that your code goes through, uh, the better. Okay, so. Now I am looking at this like this section here where we handle specifically the core and then this section here, uh, comparing all the other fields, I'm looking at those like they should be a, they should each be functions. They should each be their own functions to kind of isolate that logic. So how might we do that? This set here, the input would be the two records, the master and the dupe, as well as the fields. I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, the two records uh, and the fields, and we could output an array that represents string missing fields. And we could do the same thing here. I think that's what I'm gonna do. I am gonna remove this, all of this. Um, we're gonna come down here and write So this, what's a good name for this? What are we doing? We are um, sort of defaulting. We're not just comparing the fields, right? We are uh, filling in master values uh, from the dupes if they don't exist. So we're kind of doing some, we're both doing some defaulting and we're doing some uh, comparing obviously, and we're building a list of the uh, missing ones, or they not they're not missing. They are they're usually just not compare. They're not changed. Um, but and in a function name is generally not a great idea. Uh, like here, that means the function's doing two things, not one thing. 
Um, you want functions that are small, concise, and focused. Um, so what is a good name? Uh, probably one of the hardest challenges in programming. What is a good name for this thing? Um, for now, we are going to call call it compare records. And I said that the inputs were the master record, the duplicate record, and the fields we're comparing. Well, we'll paste that. All right, uh, compare it definitely gets a new name. I is a pretty standard index to use. Uh, most programmers should know immediately when they see an I what that is. Okay. Uh, fields. Actually, here, if we do it, if we do it this way, then WebStorm is smart enough to change them all. And the same here. I don't like having master record and dupe rec. Uh, oh, the date fields are missing, uh, but that's okay because we can just take these. And since the date fields aren't needed anywhere else outside of this function, we only care about this date fields list inside this function. That's where we can define it. Alternatively, we could have passed it in as a separate parameter, perhaps, uh, or we could make this uh, a module level variable. But if this is the only function that needs these values this way, then why not just define it inside the function? So Um, and by passing in the master and the dupe, for instance, we leave we leave the selection, you know, which one is a master, which one is a dupe. We leave that selection up to some other function. Uh, and, com and the com record comparison doesn't have to worry about it. Okay. The rest of this should stay the same. We're not changing any of the logic. I am going to shorten this. Since the temp field value is empty. Um, I think everything else should stay the same. We're not missing any uh, this. This is a problem. Oops. We need to initialize that inside this function, and then eventually we're going to output it. Right. Uh, when you're putting something on the end of an array like this, you can push it instead. Uh, push automatically puts something on the end, the back end of the array. Just like unshift put something at the front, push put something at the back. Uh, for, so I think from there, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this logic alone. Um, in the event we do ever want to come back and optimize our you know field comparison logic or add um, new fields, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, we can come right into this function and change it in here. So that's going to output uh, our missing fields. I'm not sure I like that name still. I'm not convinced, but I also don't have to be. Um, so here we can just do, let's see, string missing fields. Uh, 
Um, now that makes it less clear. So compare records. First the master record, then the dupe record, then the fields. Okay. I don't think we adjust string missing fields before that. We don't. Oh, actually, we are doing this in a loop, so we don't want to overwrite this. Um, let's see. Let's separate this out. That, and then we can say that We'll do that. We'll do that in two separate. I didn't want to call compare records. I don't need this variable. I could just put this direct call right in here, but that kind of obfuscates it. Um, I like, in this case, I like to have this split out onto a separate line so we can very clearly see this, the step we take where we uh, compare the records. And then we add the result of that to our existing set of quote unquote, missing fields. And um, then I want to do the same thing here, uh, where it's, this is kind of like, all right, so I want to take this and we're going to follow a very similar pattern. Let's collapse this. Oops. Well, although I don't think we need comparison fields this time around. Nothing else needs to change. I don't think we missed any input values. Nope. WebStorm's not telling me that anything is, is missing. Uh, we want the type coercion. Okay. That's all. So now we just put this function to use. Master record first, then dupe. I could actually, I think I'm going to reuse that variable. There's no need for a new one. And then we're going to do this again. Um, actually, I might do it this way. I might. Might go back to that. We'll do core fields. And then, so here we do our field comparisons and come up with the differences. And then here we will do, and put those nicely together. <laughs> Um, the rest of this is updating the duplicate record, which, once again, I'm going to extract into a function. Um, and the fact that I can collapse all these functions should give us a good clue that we don't actually have to care what's in them. 
um, it's just another illustration of how kind of ex extracting into functions uh, can help help you focus on what you're doing on the task at hand. Uh, so update duplicate. I just need the record. Uh, what else do we need as input? We need the string missing fields. Um, let's see. I'm going to take... Oh, that's fine. Uh, I do need the string missing fields as input. I'm just going to call it missing fields and do that. And that's it. We can, uh, this is not necessary, but uh, save returns the internal ID of the record. Um, and so usually when you save it, you can, it's nice to output it as well. Uh, not necessary, and we're not, we're not really going to do anything with that. Okay, I think I'm satisfied with this function. Um, so again, if we kind of look at these side by side, uh, we do a little setup. Uh, that happens in, in both. And then once we get below these fields, um, we can kind of compare side by side. Um, on the left, I have to scroll from 380 and and read and follow all these branches uh, and dig in all the way down to 497. So another 100, 110 lines of code um, to just to get a high level idea of all the things that are going on. Whereas over here, I can see pretty quickly um, that we find the master record and load it. Then we compare the records, we compare the core item fields, we are uh, generating and uh, generating this list of string missing fields, we are updating the duplicate record. Um, probably this can be put in an update master function as well. Um, but we can get we can get the the general idea from this, you know, 40 lines of code instead. Um, whereas here we have to we have to force ourselves to dig through all the details and specifics. Uh, whereas here we can we can get the high level just over here just to get a high level idea we have to dig through all the details and the specifics to figure out all the basic steps that are going on whereas over here we get a decent idea of the basic steps uh, that we're taking and then we only need to dig into the the details of of what we need so maybe maybe we want to add more data to the duplicate record when we update it for some reason. Uh, that's great. We can just kind of casually look through here and see, oh, okay, here's where we're updating the record. Let me jump in there and, and make my changes in here. All right. So I'm sort of satisfied. I'm not quite satisfied with our reduce yet. But I think there are some more important things I want to tackle. Also, uh, it's been about an hour of recording time. So this will be a sizable video. Um, so I am going to put a cut in here. And I think next time what we're going to do, if I collapse this, 
if I collapse everything, we have a pretty lengthy list of functions here. And this, this single module is still almost 600 lines of code. And I'm not a huge fan of that. So um, I want to take a step back at this level and see if we can't re restructure some of, some of this, some of these functions. And that's what we'll do next time.